What we all want to achieve is optimal patient access to those new medicines. And then I mean for all patients who can benefit from the new medicines. I'm Lieven Annemans and I am a health economic professor at Ghent University. And I'm also a health economic expert within uh, Ventura. And I would like to talk to you about risk sharing agreements. We know that they are becoming increasingly important, but many people wonder whether we should always use these kind of agreements, and if we use them, which one is the best type for which uh, problems. Today the key challenge is to have what we call optimal patient access to these innovative medicines. And optimal patient access, that means fast patient access for medicines of high value, that also show value for money and that are affordable to the healthcare system and to the patients. Now, one of the key issues here is uncertainty in the evidence uh, generation. Before submission for patient access, there are many possible types of uncertainty. First of all, for instance, um, uncertainty about the target population. How big is that target population? What is the incidence? What is the prevalence? Etc. Secondly, uncertainty about the current treatment. Uh, what are the effects of the current treatment? Uh, what is the, the disease history in the current world? And third, there is uncertainty, of course, also about the, the new medicine. What is the sustainability of the effect of the new medicine? What is the long-term impact on survival? Uh, are there any possible adverse events that are not yet clear from the clinical trial? Etc. Now, when there is uncertainty about the evidence uh, for that new medicine, then there might be a dilemma, because the policymaker, if he takes a decision in a situation of uncertainty, he takes a risk. And then for the industry, if they have to wait longer in order to build more evidence, then the patient access comes quite late. So both have an issue. And therefore, risk-sharing agreements can help to deal with that uncertainty and still get fast, optimal patient access. There are different types of risk-sharing agreements, or managed entry agreements as we call them. Um, suppose that the uncertainty is more related to the volume, so that means we are uncertain about the size of the target population. Then it's logic that the type of agreement is a more volume-related agreement, like a price-volume agreement or a budget cap. But when the uncertainty is more about the added value of the new medicine, then it is more logic that the agreement is a value-based agreement. For instance, on an individual level, um, if the drug does not work, then you get a money-back guarantee, or there can be a stopping rule. Those are individual value-based agreements. And then finally, there can also be population-based, value-based agreements. For instance, if on a population level the desired outcome is not reached, then the company will pay some money back to the payer. Or the reimbursement conditions can be changed over time. Of course, as we know, there are some issues with the risk-sharing agreements. A typical one is the administrative burden, especially when we apply an individual-based um, risk-sharing agreement. And we need much better health information systems to deal with that uh, problem. Secondly, what I often see is the following way of thinking. We have data, what should we do with the data? But it should be the reverse. We have a clear research question, we have a given type of uncertainty. What type of data do we need to deal with that type of uncertainty? And thirdly, in a good risk-sharing agreement, we have to make clear what will happen if the promises that are made will not be realized in routine uh, practice. So what will be the consequences for the company if the results that were promised are not obtained? I'm convinced that we're evolving to what I would call blended risk-sharing agreements. Today we see still a lot of pure financial agreements, simple discounts. But we see more and more volume-based agreements like price volume or a budget cap. And we see now increasingly the real value-based agreements like uh, coverage upon evidence development and um, money-back guarantee on a population level. And 
these will be more and more used in combination with each other and that's why I call it a blended type of risk sharing agreement. We see an increasing use of early dialogues uh, between industry and HTA bodies and payers. Well, my advice to all these stakeholders is that they should put the uncertainties on the agenda of the early dialogue, but also the types of risk sharing agreements that can be used to deal with those uncertainties. And I would also like to recommend to involve both patients and clinicians in those early dialogues. What we all want to achieve is optimal patient access to those new medicines. And then I mean for all patients who can benefit from the new medicines. And I'm really convinced that risk sharing agreements can play a very important role in achieving that goal.